11 years ago and approximately four months I stood uh, across from uh, what, who was about to be my wife, from Katie, and uh, we exchanged vows, and we uh, shared rings, and we said our I do's, and uh, it, it was a great and glorious day. But I just want to say, I'm so glad that that day occurred 11 years and four months ago before Pinterest, because there was nothing to compare my wedding to. In retrospect, when I look back at my wedding, I'm like, what were we thinking? We're quite styly now, I think, but we were not then. My suit looked like it was like, you know, from somebody about 10 sizes bigger than me. It was so baggy and it didn't fit. I had my little baby 19-year-old face and, you know, it was just... Anyway, wedding, a lot of pressure, a lot of comparisons. It was before social media. I guess there was Bebo. Uh, that was, those were the days. And so nobody was sharing anything on Bebo. That didn't matter. Anyway, you know, on a side note, I had to like email MySpace the other day <laughs> because I realized that my account was still live and there was all these old photos that when people searched me, they kept coming up and I wasn't happy with them. So I had to email MySpace and deal with it. Anyway, so complete side note, I was, I, I was at my wedding and, you know, even though I was 19 and I don't think I approve necessarily of 19 year olds getting married, but it was good for me, uh, that... I was there and, and, you know, I didn't have any fear that day because I knew one thing uh, uh, amongst many other reasons why I loved my wife. I knew that she loved me unconditionally. I knew that, that I didn't need to be afraid if she would, that, that, you know, if I didn't change or if I didn't become everything or if I didn't succeed in everything in life, I didn't have to worry whether or not she would still love me because I knew that she loved me just for who I was. And there's something powerful about entering into a relationship with somebody who loves you just the way you are and, and who you know if it, that it doesn't matter what happens in life, they've decided that they're going to love you that way forever. But even though I stood there knowing that, I couldn't help be compelled in my love for her to want to be the best version of myself. Even though she might have loved me just the way I was, my love for her wanted me to continue to transform and become everything I wanted to become. And I think it's so the same when we think of our relationships with God, that, that God loves us just the way we are. God loves you just the way you are. He's made his pledge. He said his vows. He's declared his I do's. He's put his ring on the finger, if you would, and said, you know, I will love you completely forever. His love can't even grow for you. It can't even expand for you because it's already as great as it could ever be. It, it can't get any bigger. It's just so powerful and profound. And when you encounter a love like that, like so many in this room have, and if you haven't yet, we're so praying that you do at some stage in your life. When you encounter a love like that, there's something about it that just makes you not afraid. But not only does it make you not afraid, it makes you secure, it gives you like that rest and that, that security, but you can't help but respond in love to that kind of love. And I think as followers of Jesus, when we discover that God loves us unconditionally, we don't go, cool, I'm going to be the same forever. We go, I'm going to be the best for you that I could possibly be. Why you might love me just the way I am, my love towards you would make me want to become everything that you dreamed I could become, God. And I think there's something powerful when we enter that sort of love relationship where we don't want to become to, to impress him because we don't need to, but we want to become because we love him. Because we recognize that the death of his son on a cross to pay for our mistakes and brokenness was a great cost for him to make to bring us into relationship with God. And having discovered the great grievance that our brokenness and our sin and our mistakes and our hurts cause him in his life, why would we want to continue to live that sort of life that offends God? The natural way of loving God would be to want to do your best to love him back. It's no different than a human relationship. And I think that, that it's true in this community. I feel it in this, this 7 p.m. gathering. There's a great hunger to want to love God with everything that we've got. I think there's a great appetite amongst this community to be like, we want to be everything we can be. We recognize that God loves us, and my love for God compels me to want to transform and be the, the best version of myself. I want to become everything God created me to become. I, that's one of my favorite things. That's why I get excited about our last gathering for the day, because there, there's that hunger in the room. 
And I think most of us, we have that hunger. And we have that picture even. We, we, we have this hunger in our lives right here. And we have this picture of what our lives could be. I, I think most of us could imagine our lives full of love. And could imagine our lives full of peace. And could imagine our lives where we're just for people and celebrate people. Not with like perhaps the jealousy and comparison that we can slip into. But we can imagine what becoming everything we could become looks like. I think we'd be in familiar company here. I think we'd be in familiar company here. But if you're anything like me, many times you've tried to step out from where you are with all the good intentions to become everything God's created you to become only to fall fat on your face. Flat on your face. Fat on your face. <laughs> only to, 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 to trip over yourself. Only to, you know, have, only to mess up over and over again and, and sort of come back to this place. I don't think there's any lack of desire. I don't think there's any lack of vision. I think for a lot of us, there's just a lack of how do we do that journey? How do we do it not in our own strength? How do we, how do, we do it in a way that works? You'd be in, in common company here if, if you recognize that you've tried to change at some point and you failed on the way. There's not a single human being, I think, there's definitely not someone in this room, you know, I dare you to come up here and tell me, <laughs> if there is you where you've, you, you, you've tried to diet and you've given up, you've tried to have a health week, you've tried to have a new exercise regime, you've gone, you know, you've gone away probably from one of these gatherings, I'm going to get up at 6am every day this week and read your Bible, only on Tuesday to sleep through your alarm, you know, <laughs> we've all wanted to change. And, and fallen short somewhere. And what I want to talk about is that secret, the how, the in-between, and how God wants to come into our lives and help us on this journey, how we're not on our own. Let's talk about that. In Luke chapter 1, in verse 28, it says, Gabriel, which is an angel, appeared to her, this is Mary, and said, Greetings, favored woman, the Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Just a young teenage girl and an a, a angel showing up going, greetings, favored woman. She'd probably think, what's favored about me? Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, because I think when, you know, like heavenly beings turn up, it's easy to be scared. For you have, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great, and he will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but... How can this happen? How can I get from where I am to where you're telling me I'm supposed to be? How could this thing that seems like it's completely outside of my ability, this thing that is so out of my reach, how could I get from here to there? She's asking the same question we're asking. And here's, here's uh, the angel's reply. It says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will be born holy and he will be called Son of God. Mary asked the question, how? And the angel answered the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. And the Holy Spirit is the same answer we have today. If we're asking the question, how God, Jesus has provided His very own Spirit, the Holy Spirit. If you're wondering, God, I want to love you. I want to become everything I was created to be. God's answer is cool. Step into relationship with my Holy Spirit. And my Holy Spirit can help you arrive at the destination that I've imagined for you. We've been talking over the last few weeks about what are the big pillars of this church. What's Curate Church all about? We've talked about how we're all about being, seeing people belong because we know that there's a transformational power in relationships. And so we've been talking about being a loving community and what that means. We've been talking about how we're seeing, we're about seeing people believe and come to faith because we know there's a transformational power when you, when you understand that God loves you and that the message of grace is for you and what Jesus has done for you. So we're all about the message of Jesus. But tonight I want to talk about how we all have this desire to become and God's provision for that is the presence of His Holy Spirit. That God's not the only one wondering how do you get from there to there. So He sent His Holy Spirit to help you do what you couldn't do in your own strength. So then the big question for us becomes, how do we live such a life that allows for this answer that God has given us, the Holy Spirit, to flow in a transformational way in our life? 
I believe every person, and this is the scary thing, every single person that's ever given their life to Jesus, has ever like expressed faith in Jesus, I believe they've been given the indwelling Holy Spirit. That God has given you his very own presence. But here's the thing, so many people that have been given the indwelling uh, presence of God in their life as a comforter, as an advocate, as a guide, as someone that's trying to uh, bring out the very nature of God in you, how come so many of us don't end up looking like God? Like if, if every person that's come to faith in God has been given the indwelling presence of God, doing God's work to help you become like God, how come so many of us end up stuck over here and not end up over there? And it's really because while we might have the Spirit, it's important that we nurture the right relationship with the Spirit so that it is free to work its fullness of its work inside of us. It's not enough just to have it. It's enough to learn to live with it, to learn with Him, sorry, so that, that something might flow. Does that make sense? And so I just want to talk about four postures in our life that if we take them, I think it opens up God's work of His Holy Spirit to work in its fullness so that you might go from here to there. So the first one is this. Surrender. In, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you, give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, surrender to them to God, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, pleasing, and perfect. I love in here, it says God wants to transform you. He says that God's going to change the way you think, that something's going to change, but it starts with this thing of sacrifice. It finishes with transformation and understanding the will of God, but it begins with, with dear brothers and sisters, lay your life down as a sacrifice to God. And I think the first step to seeing the Holy Spirit be able to do the fullness of its work in you, that you might become all that God's created you to become, is this, surrender your life to the Spirit. See, when we surrender your life, what I mean is this. I mean, take that innermost part of you. Psychologists call it this, your will, and surrender it to God. Your will is like your, your, uh, the home of your desires. It's the place where what you want lives. Your will is your gift from God of free choice and your ability to self-determine where your life goes and the shape that it makes. Your will, I think, is one of the huge natures that makes you created in the image of God. It's the center. It's your will. Your ability to make things happen. Your ability to, 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 to determine the direction of your life to a certain degree. And here's why surrendering it's so important. Because while God's so powerful and so sovereign and so able to work so miraculously in so many different situations and events and circumstances, there's one area where God has determined he will never work unless he's invited to work, and that's in our will. Because if God was to bulldoze your will, he would, you would cease to be fully human. You would no longer have free choice. You can no longer love freely if he would make you love freely. You could no longer serve freely if he was making you serve freely. So he has to stay out of your will unless he's invited into your will because otherwise he would be like stepping on. He's just determined that he's not going to do that. He's not going to meddle in that business. That's what it means to be human. And that's the power of coming alive in a relationship with God. He doesn't make you, you choose it. But so many at times we can miss this step in the transformation process. We can, we can accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior without truly surrendering the deepest part of ourselves and inviting him to work there. And when we don't surrender that deepest part of ourselves, what we're trying to do is behavior modification, transforming from the outside in, and it just never works. You're going, God, I don't want to lust anymore, but I still sort of want to lust because my will hasn't been changed. So it's really hard to resist him. God, I don't want to get angry at those people anymore. I don't want to get frustrated at the circumstance anymore. But all you're trying to do is discipline yourself to not get frustrated. You haven't had a will change on the inside. But when you invite the Spirit into your your will, a transformation begins to take place where you don't want to lust anymore. You don't want to get angry anymore. You don't want to hate anymore. It, it takes time for it to happen, but it can happen where you begin to want what God wants. 
You don't have to wake up in the morning and say 10 mantras to want what God wants. You can just wake up with the very nature of God inside of you if you keep inviting Him into your will. And I think it's good news if you're facing temptations and you're facing struggles. If you would keep inviting Him and surrendering, into, surrendering your will, He will shape your will after His own desires. You don't have to fight that same battle forever. Just invite Him into your will. The desires will start being birthed from the inside out. All of a sudden, it won't be hard to choose to love and to choose to forgive and to choose to serve and to choose to be generous because you'll want to. They won't be disciplines from the outside in. They'll be a changed heart from the inside out. And that's what God wants. We've got to begin with surrender. I saw this story online February 11th this year. South Sudan, 300 child soldiers laid down their arms and finally let somebody help them. Child soldiers in South Sudan is a common problem. I don't understand heaps about it, but I understand it's a very common problem. And what happens is children get abducted from their homes at younger ages, and then they get militarized, and they get brainwashed, and they get you know brought into sort of like a you know a, a different type of family, and they get drugged, and they get indoctrinated with a way of war and a way of hate. To the point where people enter those countries and people from those countries try to rescue these soldiers, but the soldiers end up killing them and abducting them and abusing the very people that are coming to set them free. They are raging war against their helpers. They don't know how lost and how broken they actually are, and so they are actually resisting what they perceive as an enemy, but it's not an enemy, it's a friend. But what I loved about seeing this video online is there's 300 of them and they're all giving up their guns to this particular charity. And I love this idea because it must have been such a huge step for this whole, like, you know, this whole contingent of child soldiers to finally stop warring against what they perceived as an enemy and have a change of heart and realize these people had their best interests at heart. And what was about to take place is these children, as they were handing over the guns, they were all singing. And you could see a transformation beginning to take place. And as they interviewed part of the the workers and the charity and the volunteers, they they started talking about what's now going to happen to these children, about how these children, they're going to be logged in a database and family, their families are going to be tried to be found. And those who have lost their families, they're going to be placed into orphanages and into surrogate families. And and how all of these kids are going to be enrolled in school and how they're all about to see the doctor and get a health checkup and how they've got psychologists waiting to see them to help them get over over their trauma and they've been enlisted into sports teams as part of the healing process and you just think all of that help was available to them if only they stopped resisting it and surrendered and God's not against you he's so for you all of that help is available to you but it's on the other side of surrender and I know surrender can be so terrifying because when you give over your gun you don't know what's going to happen If you truly say, God, you are my portion, I want for nothing more. God, I give you all of my dreams. God, I give you all of my desires. God, I give you everything that I want in my life, and I trust you'll give me back what matters. It might not be what matters to you in that particular moment, but I'm going to trust God that you know what matters more than I know what. That is a terrifying moment. That is a handing over of the gun moment. But we're not handing it over to an enemy. We're handing it over to a friend. We're not handing it over to a church. We're not handing it over to a leader. We're handing it over to a God who loves us. And we're saying, God, have your way in my innermost being. That's where transformation begins. That's how we start getting in step with the Holy Spirit working in us. Surrender. The second thing is this. The second thing is we need to foster a relationship with the Spirit. There's something about uh, having a relationship with the Spirit. Once you have a relationship, it can start to guide the choices that you make in life. Once we've surrendered and we've let Him in, uh, then the next step is to foster such a relationship that as He prompts and you know, pulls and speaks to us, we we know his voice and we can hear his promptings and we can feel his nudges in our life. That relationship is not formed in the seen areas of our life, it's formed in the unseen areas of our life. The heaps of that survey that you thankfully did earlier, and we'll see which gathering is the greatest gathering when it comes to spiritual disciplines. Uh, you, <laughs> you, that we, those are about times, they're not about spiritual disciplines and about reading the Bible and about prayer. They're about fostering a relationship with the Spirit so that we might know its voice. We might know His voice. We might know the promptings and feel the nudges so that when we live our lives, we can follow its leading. We can't follow its leading if we don't know His voice. 
I've got four children. And I can be here on a Sunday and there could be hundreds of adults and hundreds of children like we have in the morning. It's, you know, some form of beautiful chaos. And, and it's amazing with the hundreds of people here and the chaos everywhere and the noise level, every person speaking, there's noise everywhere. If one of my ch- children, if, if, if they're crying, if they make a noise, it's amazing that through the hundreds of other noises, I can hear that one noise. There's something about, like, uh, when it's your child's noise, there's something about it that, that you, you just know instinctively the unique characteristics of that child's cry, of that child's voice, of that child's scream. You just know as a parent. You know the reason you know is because you've spent so much time listening. That whether you like it or not, you've spent every day with that child. You've heard that cry a million times. You've heard that voice a thousand times. You've heard that scream a thousand times. And so it's so familiar to you that you can pull it out amongst the crowd and the noise. And I believe that's exactly how God wants us to be with his spirit, that his sound would be so familiar to his, to our ear. His, the feeling of when he comes and he's moving and nudging us would be so familiar to our skin. The thoughts of the spirit, they'll be so familiar to our mind that when they come, we could, we could identify them amongst the thousand. When a million thoughts are running around in your head, you'll be like, oh, that's the spirit. I'll follow that one. When, 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 when a, you know, a million emotions are rushing through you and one just comes up that's a little bit different, you can go, oh, that's the spirit. That's the one I'm supposed to follow in this moment. But that is formed in the secret parts of our life. That's formed when nobody's watching. That's formed when you get up early in the morning and when you take time at lunchtime and rather than tuning in on Netflix for another hour, you just think, I'll read the Bible for one minute first. You know, it's formed in all those little and big moments when nobody's watching, but it's not about doing empty disciplines. It's about transformation and learning to hear the voice of the Spirit. Surrender, relationship, obedience. Obedience is our third way that we position ourselves for the how of the Holy Spirit to work. Once we've learned, once we've learned uh, His voice, we need to trust it and obey it. Hayden and I went to the rugby on Friday, Chiefs with the Hurricanes. It was pouring down with rain. It was all round horrible experience and a horrible game. The, you know, the upside was the drive there and back with Hayden. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so nice, I know. <laughs> But but Hayden used to play rugby, and so he understands things about the game that I don't understand. And when we're driving home, he he said, did you notice how in the back line, like when all the kicks went up, and I know like a lot of people are rolling their eyes because it's a rugby analogy, but uh, you know, when the kick goes up, did you notice how like the fullback and the winger and the, the back line who were in position to take the kick, did you notice how much they were talking to each other? I was like, I did not even notice. He said, well, if you look closely, you can see that when one person commits to catching the ball they have to put their eyes on one thing and that's the ball they can't take their eyes off that ball and so they just have to concentrate on catching that ball that's their one job but their buddies around them their job is to make sure they know what's happening around them because they can't see what's happening around them because they have to keep their eyes on the ball and so as the winger goes up to uh, catch the ball the fullback might be saying to them hey it's okay they're 10 meters away or you know brace yourself for impact or you're going to need to land and side that they're going to be communicating because there's things that they can see that the person catching the ball can't see. And because of that, there needs to be an incredible trust between the person catching the ball so that they can trust that they're going to be their eyes because they have to stay focused. There, there needs to be a trust there. And I think that same trust is what God is wanting us to form with His Spirit that we need to keep our eye on one thing. I'm following Jesus, but the Spirit can see so many different things. And He's looking out, and He's looking at our surroundings. And and there's lots of things that don't make sense to our lives. But when we trust the voice of the Spirit, and we choose and we predetermine that we will obey that voice when it doesn't make sense and when it does make sense, because we need to stay focused, and the Spirit can see what we can't see. We need to have an unconditional obedience to God. If you don't have an unconditional obedience, you're never going to go from there to there. Because ultimately, God's not God to you. He's just an added bonus. But if he is God and he knows what you don't know, and he can see what you can't see, why would you not trust him and obey him? If he says, give some money to that person on the side of the road, why would you not be getting your wallet out? Why would you be wondering why? It doesn't matter. The Spirit's asking you to do something. He can see things that you can't see. 
When he says, hey, just let this thing go. Just forget about it. I know they posted that, but don't worry about it. Well, why would you think, well, I can't just worry about it. I need to protect myself. I need to defend myself with the Spirit saying, don't worry about it. Maybe the Spirit sees something you can't see. And we just need to go, if the Spirit speaks, if the Spirit prompts, if the Spirit nudges, I'm going to be there. I'm not going to ask the questions, why, or why do you want me to do that, or how this is going to work out. I'm just going to be like, if you say jump, Spirit, I'm jumping, because I know you can see things I can't see. And we need to live with that unconditional obedience if we truly want to become all that we could become. And the last thing is this, surrender, relationship, obedience. The last thing is this, we need to live with expectation. Acts chapter 3. I'm going to land the plane on this point. Tells us this story. It says, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the three o'clock prayer service. As they approached the temple, a man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate and one, the one called the beautiful gate, the most magnificent gate, the most glorious gate into the temple. So he could beg from the people going to the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at him eagerly, expecting some money because he's a beggar. But Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but I'll give you what I have in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. And we know that means the power of the Holy Spirit. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and he helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and his ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, he stood to his feet and he began to walk. Then walking, leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them for the first time. Lame men weren't allowed in the temple. He had heard the worship on the other side. He had heard the excitement on the other side. He had heard the prayers on the other side. But because he was lame, he was, he was defective. He was not allowed in. I know it's a crazy system, but something about his brokenness stopped him from having the life that God would have for him. But in this moment, you can see why he doesn't just walk and why he doesn't just leap while he begins praising God because he's now somewhere he's never been before. And all the people saw him walking and they heard him praising. When they realized he was the lame beggar, they were absolutely astounded. They all rushed out in amazement to Solomon's colonnade where the man was holding tightly to Peter and John. The story goes on to tell us that Peter and John seized the opportunity and they preached the message and many heard the message of Jesus. But I want to tell you, this lame man is not that different from us and our brokenness, us and our, our, our incompleteness, us and our, our bad habits and our things that we know are very different from the life that we can see in our future, from the life we desire in the future, the way we desire to live to honor God. We his, his stuff's not that different from ours. See, for him, he had a condition. He was lame from birth. And rather than believing that something could be changed and something could, could be fixed, that something could be better, he just decided to make a life out of his brokenness, make a life out of his sickness. See, rather than believing that God would change things, he just, he just dropped his expectation level to go, this is the way it's always going to be, so I'll just be a beggar, a lame beggar. That's all I can be. Isn't that so that what we do, we go, man, I'm here and I want to be there, but I've tried to walk that a few times and I've failed. So you know what? I'm just going to be here and tell myself it's okay. I'm just going to make a life out of being here. I know I'm supposed to be there, but that just seems impossible. It seems I've, I've walked it so many times and been disappointed so many times. And I want to tell us that part of the how is expecting that you can get from there to here. See, there's a saying that says, when the river's low the rocks will show. Tells us that when we get worn out, when we get a bit depleted, maybe when the margins go in our lives, that the rocks, the hard parts, the brokenness, this stuff seems to come to the surface a little bit more. And it's amazing because this is what we do when the rocks show. We don't go, thank you, God, that I'm in this depleted season where I've been pushed to the brink and you've just shown me brokenness in me I didn't even know was there. Nobody says that. People go, I need a day off. I need to bring the river back up. I need to hide this stuff. 
Maybe I need a holiday. Maybe somebody needs to, maybe I need to change churches. Maybe I need to stop some commitments. Maybe I need to pull back a little bit. Maybe they need to change how they're talking to me and treating me because I need this river to come back up so these rocks don't show. None of us go, thank you, God, for showing me my rocks. We go, give me some more river. That doesn't solve anything. It just covers things up. It's just a lame beggar deciding he's going to be lame forever. And I think we need to live as followers of Jesus believing that life is actually possible. This complete life, this fruit of the Spirit life filled with love and peace and joy and kindness and goodness and self-control. It's possible. Jesus wouldn't have said it was unless it was. He wouldn't have said that you can have this life to the full unless it was actually possible to step into it. And I believe we need this fresh expectation that who God's called us to be is actually possible to be that person by the power of the Spirit. We surrender to it. We build a relationship with Him. We follow His promptings and His leadings. And we expect the impossible to happen. I don't know what you've carried in here tonight. My list is huge of rocks and brokenness. Because all of our list is huge. We've all got stuff we're embarrassed of and we're ashamed of. But we can't hold our head low and go, this is never going to change. Faith surely causes us to lift our chin up and believe that something could be different one day. But the church doesn't have a lot of silver and gold. But what we do have is the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit walks in the room, when the Holy Spirit extends his hand to someone, when the Holy Spirit reaches out in compassion, lame men can walk. And if lame men can walk, addicted people can be set free. Angry people can become kind. Stingy people can become generous. People struggling with lust can learn to value and appreciate and love. Whatever it is that you've carried in here that you imagine, hey, I know, I want to be that person. I want to tell you, if you would expect God to move, God might begin to move. 